So good morning again. I'm Tom Farr, uh, president of the Religious Freedom Institute and director of Georgetown University's Religious Freedom Research Project. Welcome to the National Press Club for what promises to be an intellectually stimulating, challenging, and hopeful conference for all of us. Today's event marks the culmination of a multi-year program called Under Caesar's Sword, Responses to Christian Persecution. Or I should, let me rephrase that, Christian Responses to Persecution, an important correction. The project has been generously supported throughout these last several years by the Templeton Religion Trust. Our proceedings today are hosted by the Religious Freedom Institute and the Center for Ethics and Culture at Notre Dame University in collaboration with Aid to the Church in Need USA. Our co-sponsors include the groups in defense of Christians, the Institute for Global Engagement, and Notre Dame's program on church and society. Each of these groups is represented here today. The Under Caesar Sword project was also supported by Georgetown University's Religious Freedom Research Project, which I'm honored to lead, and its partner, Baylor University's Institute for Studies of Religion, headed by Professor Byron Johnson, who is here with us today. Now, most of you are aware, many of you perhaps acutely so, of the scourge of global religious persecution. The problem is well documented, and it's not a stretch to label it a worldwide crisis. Religious persecution and the global decline of religious freedom, which accompanies it, are destroying lives and families, uprooting minorities, ruining economic development, fueling religious violence and terrorism, and undermining any possibility of political and social stability. Across the world, religious minorities are suffering terribly from these depredations, including Muslims, Yazidis, Baha'i, Ahmadiyya, Buddhists, Hindus, Jews, and others. We at the Religious Freedom Institute and at Georgetown's Religious Freedom Research Project have studied the travail of each of these groups. We funded scholarly research and held conferences here and abroad. We published books on the tenets of religious freedom in each of the five major world traditions, religious traditions, including Islam, Buddhism, Judaism, Hinduism. We've had conferences and issued reports on threats to Muslim minorities here and abroad. Our deep and abiding concern over the global crisis and religious persecution is one reason why the Religious Freedom Institute is working to protect the religious freedom of everyone, everywhere. But today, we are gathered to focus on the single most persecuted minority, the Christians of the world. It's entirely appropriate that we do this. For one thing, the data show that Christians are at the top of the list of those minorities suffering religious persecution and violence. For another, most Christian minorities, almost universally, make contributions to the societies in which they live and worship. And speaking personally, I can tell you that my own understanding of Christian doctrine, which is shared by many Christians, is that we stand for the religious freedom of all people, not in spite of our religious beliefs, but because of them. Now, many studies have appeared concerning the phenomenon of Christian persecution, and some of the authors of those studies are with us today. However, our program, our work, is, so far as we know, the only sustained analysis of how Christian minorities are responding to that persecution. Today, you will hear from a variety of experts in the field, including many of the scholars we can commission to do field research on the nature of Christian responses to persecution. In December 2015, we held a major international conference in Rome to showcase the findings of these scholars, which will appear soon in an edited volume by a major university press. Today, however, we're going to focus on perhaps the most important question emerging 
from this study. What is to be done? How can Christian minorities themselves draw on the experiences of their counterparts around the world to cope with Christian, with, with persecu persecution? How do they cope? What are the patterns that can be learned one from the other? What can we do as Christians and non-Christians to help them? What can governments do and why should they do it? Is the scourge of Christian persecution, like the persecution of other minorities in the world, purely a humanitarian catastrophe, which it surely is? Or are there strategic dimensions that should also be taken into account? Later this morning, you'll hear from the primary force behind this project, Professor Dan Philpott of Notre Dame. Dan will brief you on the magnificent report of which he was the primary author, entitled In Response to Persecution. We have copies of this report on the tables. I hope you'll take them with you uh, uh, today when you leave. Let me also mention the extraordinary work of our colleague, uh, Christy Haas of Notre Dame, the project manager of Under Caesar's Sword, whose vision and hard work have made this event possible. After Dan speaks, you will watch a riveting and somewhat disturbing documentary film on the subject produced by one of, as one of the fruits of this project and then hear from other colleagues who have poured themselves into this work over many years, including our own Dr. Timothy Shaw of the Religious Freedom Institute, Dan's primary partner uh, in the conception and implementation of Under Caesar's Sword. So as you can see from your programs, which you have in front of you, we have an exciting day ahead, several panels, an important lunchtime address, so strap on your seat belts, if you will. Now, I have the distinct honor of introducing our keynote speaker, Cardinal Donald World, Archbishop of Washington, D.C. This is a particular pleasure for me, Your Eminence. Uh, you may recall you were the keynote speaker for one of the very first events uh, that we held uh, for the Religious Freedom Project at Georgetown University. It was entitled Catholic Perspectives on Religious Freedom. Donald World was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He has received graduate degrees from the Catholic University of America, the Gregorian University in Rome, and a doctorate in theology from the University of St. Thomas in Rome. He was ordained a bishop by Pope John Paul II, or as we call him, St. John Paul the Great, in 1986, served as auxiliary bishop in Seattle, and then for 18 years as bishop of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. In 2006, he was appointed by Pope Benedict XVI as Archbishop of Washington and elevated by Pope Benedict to the College of Cardinals in 2010. Cardinal War participated in the March 2013 conclave that elected our per current Holy Father, Pope Francis. His eminence is one of the most active, involved members of the Catholic hierarchy in the world. He serves on a wide variety of national and international bodies, including the Vatican Congregations for the Doctrine of the Faith, of bishops for the clergy, the pontifical councils for promoting Christian unity, for culture, and the administration of the patrimony of the Apostolic See. Cardinal Whirl is the author, author of many publications, including over a dozen books, including his latest, and perhaps the most relevant for our purposes today, To the Martyrs, a reflection on the supreme Christian witness. If you will permit me to end this introduction of Cardinal Whirl by reading briefly from his conclusion to this marvelous little book, which I highly recommend. After quoting Jesus on martyrs, the Cardinal writes, St. Peter told the first Christians that they should consider themselves aliens and exiles in this world. Here, we read in the letter to the Hebrews, we have no lasting city. So as strangers and foreigners, we will go through life and we will be misunderstood and distrusted. We should not be surprised then when people treat us as interlopers and a threat, even as we are loving them unconditionally. We should not be surprised when people today, like Nero long ago, accuse us of hatred of humanity when they call us bigots and charge us with discrimination for daring to, to speak the truth with love. 
We should not be surprised when, like the Emperor Julian, rulers try to legally exclude us from the professions and for, from participation in civic life. We should not be surprised when, like King Henry VIII, they say we are disloyal citizens who follow a foreign king. Well, we want to stand with our king, Jesus, and we want to live with him. And like the martyrs, die with him, if that's what is God's will. If you and I should be called to such witness, writes Cardinal Worrell, we should remember that we don't stand alone. We stand with the whole church on earth. We stand with the saints and with the angels. In the meantime, we must make it our mission to stand with those who are suffering today. We must stand in solidarity with them and re-echo their testimony to all the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome His Eminence, Cardinal Donald Worrell.